Well, uh, good evening, Yvonne. Thank you for having me. Uh, basically, they're trying to slow this thing that's going almost 40,000 kilometres an hour to about 32 kilometres an hour by the time it splashes down, and that's quite a lot. And what happens when things are travelling this fast towards Earth's atmosphere? I mean, the air feels kind of nice to me. It's easy to breathe. But going that fast, the air is kind of thick and really hard to get through. So there's a lot of pressure, a lot of friction, and you're talking about temperatures that are sort of 2,800 degrees Celsius. And I don't know how much you know about the sun, Yvonne, but that's actually... Um, just over half the temperature at the surface of the sun. Uh, they're testing this heat shield. It's got the same epoxy resin uh, as was used in the Apollo program, uh, but it's been applied differently and it'll burn off during re-entry. The intensity is crazy and they'll actually have a comm blackout for several minutes due to air being ionized. We've got to have a five meter uh, shield and it's gonna pop off eventually. And these 11 parachutes are gonna pop out and then it's just gonna slowly descend. So it's an incredibly complex maneuver Oh my goodness, it really does sound complex. We look forward to seeing that happen. How is the planned return different though to that of Apollo 8 when it splashed down in the Pacific Ocean in 1968? Surely a lot has changed since then. Well, I don't think Apollo 8 carried Snoopy and Moonikins on board, uh, but I'm sure that's not what you mean. Uh, it's far hotter and faster than a spacecraft coming back from, say, the ISS or um, Apollo. Um, and it's actually the fastest for a spacecraft that that's actually designed to carry crew. Uh, space shuttle crew, for example, you know, only re-entered the atmosphere at a, you know, really slow 17,500 kilometres per hour. Now, the other difference and possibly the main difference that you're referencing there is that the Apollo 8 crew, once they sort of started coming in, it was a direct entry. So they come in and then they just basically set where they're gonna land. But what Orion's doing is this new thing. I say new, but it's been known for a long time. It's the first time we're ever gonna do it. It's called a skip re-entry. So if you've ever been down sk skimming stones, the skip re-entry is kind of like that. It goes down a little bit in the Earth's atmosphere. So it goes about, about so it hits about 122K up above us, and then it's in the atmosphere. It comes down to about 61K, and then it's actually gonna roll over 180 degrees, which generates some lift takes it back into space and then comes back down again. So this will actually cut off 500 kilometres an hour the first time, which means that it sort of reduces the G-forces and, and basically slows it down a lot easier. But the main thing here is that because it's doing this manoeuvre, they can actually change where or direct it as to where it's going to land, which is a completely different thing to Apollo 8. Mm. And how will it help um, with future re-entries uh, with crew on board? Well, uh, assuming it works, it's going to help uh, a great deal for NASA and Lockheed Martin to say, yes, the underside of this heat shield does work, which is very, very important, I'm sure, to the astronauts as well. And secondly, this uh, skip re-entry technique is testing this theory essentially and it's designed to lower the g-forces now i don't know if you've seen top gun but you know those g-forces can help you it can actually make you black out because whenever we're you know above gravity sort of forces they actually put a lot of stress on our heart and that can actually stop um basically affect our uh, our body it makes it very stressed and we can get dizzy and we can get blackouts so it's quite crucial that we can test this maneuver so that when we put astronauts in there for the first time that we they don't experience these bad effects. Mm, I notice uh, there's a lot of if here. Clearly nothing's, nothing can go wrong with Orion's splashdown, right? Oh, Yvonne, look, uh, there's about 22,500 kilos of Orion and it's worth about 28 billion US dollars. So I'm sure there's a lot of people crossing their fingers that nothing goes wrong. Um, now, whenever anything tries to enter the atmosphere, there's kind of uh, two things that could go wrong. It can either basically come in too shallowly and bounce off or it can come in too steeply and actually burn up. Now, you think, oh, it's probably easy. Well, it's got a 24 kilometre window, give or take. Sounds big, but... Imagine the Earth is a basketball. Imagine the moon is a baseball. Put them 6.7 metres apart and you're trying to hit a target that's about the width of a sheet of paper. Wow. So that's how exact it has to be. Thanks for putting that into context for us. Not easy at all. What else has Orion achieved during its 26-day deep space trek? Oh, it's been really awesome. So because we can say this, though, it's it's gone 432,210 
kilometres beyond Earth on day 13, which is actually the furthest any spacecraft that's actually designed to carry humans has travelled. All told, it's 2.2 million kilometres it's travelled. They're testing all this equipment and instruments and groups of people and, and uh, understanding of how all this new equipment works together, which is the first. It came within 130 kilometres of the lunar surface, which is actually the closest flyby. Uh, that was about the 5th or the 6th of December, depending on which side of the dateline you, you live on. Um, and it sent some close-up pictures of the moon, which are actually the first pictures that NASA has uh, actually achieved uh, on a, an orbiting spacecraft for 50 years. It released a bunch of little satellites. It did some radiation tests on yeast on board. It had these torsos. One was wearing a, a radiation vest and the other one wasn't. And they were comparing how uh, basically radiation vests are, are going to work. And yeah, it's a big test of some really new equipment. It's achieved so much and we've been showing some of those pictures too. Now, if Orion aces it uh, splashed down on Sunday, NASA can be begin preparing for the next flight in its Artemis program, Artemis 2. Tell us about that. Yeah, so we're looking late 2024 or so. You're talking for human crew this time, not necessarily just Snoopy and Moonikin. Uh, it's going to circle Earth twice on this cool thing called a hybrid free return. So it's to give it enough kick. It goes to the moon. It's going to swing around and return. This mission is uh, expected to last between eight and ten days, but it might actually go for a bit longer, maybe three weeks, just depending on how the, the mission objectives pan out. Uh, this will be the furthest distance from Earth of any humans in history history thanks to this incredible new spacecraft and it's basically Yvonne the live test and I'm kind of glad I'm not on it. <laughs> <laughs> Claire what about Artemis 3 that's scheduled to put boots down near the lunar south pole in 2025 or 2026? Yeah, it's incredible actually thinking about this. Uh, so this is the final sort of Artemis mission. Uh, you're right, it's going to be the first woman and first person of colour to walk on the moon. They're touching down or they're aiming to go to the lunar south pole. This is a really cool area that's kind of mysterious. Uh, it's a different environment to where all the Apollo astronaut astronauts went around and explored. They all went sort of near the equator-ish. Uh, and these moon rocks can be, you know, 4.3 billion years old. And that's sort of going to look at about late 2025, 2026. And and these uh, basically the whole idea is that these two of these uh, astronauts from the Orion module will go down to the surface and spend about six and a half days there. And it'll be the first time we've really been uh, on the moon since uh, 1972. Amazing stuff. And after that, just finally, because we are running out of time, but I do want to ask you, there'll be more missions if all goes according to plan. NASA's talking about establishing a crewed Artemis base camp by 2030. It sounds like science fiction, doesn't it? It and does. And it's only a decade away. I know. Uh, they basically do want to establish a crewed Artemis base camp. And, you know, that's not the only thing. All of this is really just a bit of a, I guess, dry or wet run, I suppose, uh, to go to Mars. They really want to go to Mars and they've got to get all of this right and actually be sustainable before they can go there. That's a good goal to have, isn't it, to go to Mars. Claire Kenyon, thanks so much for explaining that to us. Really appreciate it. My pleasure, Yvonne.